were joined in the occupied West Bank by the Palestinian journalist Basaladra, who writes for 972. He spent years documenting Israeli efforts to evict Palestinians living in Masafriyata, south of Hebron. He wrote the new cover story for The Nation magazine, headlined, The Destruction of This Palestinian Community Was Green Lighted by Israel's Supreme Court. On Saturday, he was detained while covering an Israeli settler attack at Masafariyata. After he refused to hand over his video footage, Israeli soldiers handcuffed and blindfolded him, then sat him in a chair in the blazing sun for hours. The Union of Journalists in Israel denounced Basel's detention, describing it as a, quote, serious violation of freedom of the press. Basel Adra joins us now from South Hebron. Um, Basel, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you describe exactly what took place on Saturday? I don't hear you if you're speaking. Thank you. Sorry for this. Uh, on Saturday, I got a call from a Palestinian shepherd and a neighbor that the settlers invading his uh, his field, there was armed settlers and with the, with their sheep in a Palestinian pro special property grazing there, as this is the recent policy of the settlers where they come over and attack Palestinians in their fields and taking of the private properties. And this is the policy of the Israeli state recently by supporting these settlers, attacking more Palestinians and taking more land and creating more new outposts and uh, farms in Palestinian fields and the Palestinian agricultural fields. So I was filming there. Later on arrived the police and, uh, and the Israeli occupation army. They invading houses in my village. They tried to arrest uh, people under the claim that the settlers said that their Palestinians were throwing stones at them. So soldiers went directly invading some houses, beating up people and, and try to arrest them. And then an uh, officer headed to me and said, give me your ID and your phone. And they searched my body and he told me, you, you need to open your phone. I told him this is illegal. There is a rules for this. I'm a journalist and here my card. There is the police is just here. They didn't ask me anything for, for this. And he said, no, uh, you should give, you should open your phone now and be released or there is another long way to get the videos from you. And he didn't like uh, say what is the long way. So minutes after that, he called like another group of soldiers who came in another jeep and asked them to take me away. So directly they took me behind their jeep. The settlers were there and started like the settlers them, them, themselves like cursing me while the soldiers were handcuffed me and covering my eyes before put me in the, inside the jeep and start driving away. Uh, I, I couldn't see, I couldn't know where I am going. And then in the way they stopped and they transferred like me in another soldier's uh, car and also kept driving until we arrived in, in, a, in a place which is their military military base. And like they took me down from their car, started pushing me hardly. I was I trying to ask them where, where they're going with me, what they're doing. I can't see why you're pushing me like this. I don't see where I am walking, where, where I'm putting my legs. And they just keep telling me to shut up and uh, cursing me that I'm a dog and I, I, they know who I am because I film them like uh, all the time when they come to destroy houses, when they are coming like to back the, the settlers and when they also come to invade the villages in the night or in the day. So there, there is really the, the scary thing for me that, they, they, the, that there is a hate and I'm a Barcelona journalist and there is a hate from them toward me just because I, I take my phone or my camera and go film them when they are doing like these crimes because they know that they are doing something they don't want it to be published outside so they they let me sit in a chair uh, i tried to ask them where i am what is going on with me they asked me about my phone while my phone was with the officer and my id also and they kept like telling me that i'm a liar and uh, that i am bad and this like why you are not going to Janine? what well, if you i'm writing to al jazeera uh, and then like I stayed there for for hours before the officer came again and put me in the in in the in the jeep and then take me to the entrance of the village, release me with my phone. Later on, the army spokesperson said I was taken to police to give a testimony. I was not detained, which is really totally lie. They took my phone illegally. I don't know what they did with it, 
and I was just sitting in the sun being cursed by these occupation soldiers, uh, who's for them, it's really fun like to do that. I was asking them, you would never, I was telling them, you would never ever be brave to do this to an international or Israeli journalist. I don't wish that, but this is, will never happen here. Just because I'm a Palestinian, it doesn't matter, journalist, Palestinian shepherd, Palestinian farmer, uh, a landowner, doesn't matter, I am Palestinian in the end of the day, and there is a foreign army, which is the Israeli occupation forces that controls our life and can do whatever they want because they, they have the power to do it. And this is not the first time for me personally to face this. Just last May, I was beaten up for, for like 40 minutes, really assaulted very hardly. It was filmed on a video where they were beating me up just because I reached uh, my neighbor to film the four soldiers trying to take down his shelter. And they decided to arrest me in that moment. I was like protesting, telling them, this is illegal. You don't have excuse. I am a journalist, just come here to for documentation. And it was like just masked soldiers who with the ruffles and uniform and beating me really hard, grabbing me on the ground, like putting my body on the ground, catching my legs and my hands, try to grab me to, the, to their military jeep. I was too scared for that and I was like hospitalized after 40 minutes of them beating me up. And also like if you want another example about me personally, like on December 2021 at night, they invaded my home. They confiscated the cameras and the laptop and the car that I use alongside with other activists here for the documentation in Masafariyat and the police and the army kept them for for at least one month in their offices before the court ordered them to bring this back. Jour but for now, like four Palestinian journalists sitting in, in Israeli jail in administ administrative detention without any charge, without any accuse, just because they are Palestinians. We don't see the European Union, the US sending condemnations about these acts, that journalists sitting in jail without charge, just because they are Palestinians. And what is the freedom of press? Last month, just in June, my, my friend and close colleague, uh, Ihab Alami, for example, from Beit Omar, Nadar, of Hebrew, of Hebron, was shot in his leg by an Israeli soldier when the soldiers were invading his town and he was filming them. The, the camera were there, uh, very clear that he's a journalist. He was wearing a vest, say, like telling that he's the, it's a press, like he's a journalist. And even though they shot him, no one talked about this. No one wrote about it. You don't see the the the, the Western like embassies here in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv writing about it that there was a journalist like was shot unless like someone like Sharina Boakli that he, we love her so much that was shot in Jenin because she's a woman, she has American passport. Then everyone talk about her. But this daily harassments and like this is just I was like detained for two hours. And, 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 and sit up under the sun, but all the, all, the, all the time I go out in the field, they try to push me back really hardly. They create flying checkpoints to stop us as journalists and taking our IDs, wasting our time to prevent us, follow the forces that, for example, demolishing a home or cutting a water well in Masaf Riyata. So this is, we've been like really, we're really tired and rescue our life to go film this, these crimes. And they, they are really making it very hard for us to do this. And they, it doesn't matter for them what a price we will pay for this, because they know that they, there is no consequences for, the, for their acts and their violence toward us. And Basil Adra, I wanted to ask you, uh, obviously this crackdown of the government, continued crackdown, on uh, Palestinian journalists is as a result of what the Israeli government is doing and what you are chronicling. Could you talk about the, uh, you report that over a thousand people are at risk of immediate banishment and, and the army has already started demolishing homes and schools to make way for more settlements. Could you talk about what you've seen in, the, uh, uh, in these demolitions? Yes. Yeah, so. For me personally, since I born until today, I, I witnessed and I document hundreds of, of demolitions of Palestinian houses and the properties in Masaf Riyata, and it's the most hard thing to, to see and to witness. And especially now when I go to film this, I see families, children, like, and my mothers stand aside and watching Israeli bulldozers do demolishing their homes or their school or their, their water well, and they are just crying, and I'm there just filming, feeling really powerless and hopeless on this situation. And just a few hundred meters away from 
from my home and my community that is the, the Israeli outpost and settlement that keep, keep expanding. What I've seen since I born until today, just the Israeli settlements are expanding. They're getting water, a clean water, and asphalt roads and homes. Every day they are building and expanding more and more on our land. And the bulldozers there for them just come to dig the land and to create more houses and farms, huge cow farms, chicken farms, uh, vineyard and cherries. All, all kinds of farms around these settlements are expanding toward our land. While I see and I witness a weekly of Israeli bulldozers coming toward Masafir Yatta to our communities and demolishing houses, schools, water wells, water pipes, like bulldozering roads in order to squeeze our communities and to drive us away from here. So what happened is in the 80s, they designated 14 communities of Masafir Yatta out of 20 as a firing zone, which is military uh, military area. Like they want, they, they want to take this land for the Israeli occupation forces to do military exercises. But Israeli politician Ariel Sharon at that time wrote in his secret documents that he's designating Masafir Yatta as a firing zone area under, under the pretext to, to take this land for the Israeli settlements. These documents that he wrote in the 80s when he made this first designation, it was released a year ago from now. So from the 80s until the last year, they were trying very hard by pr putting pressure on the Palestinians of Masaf Riyata life in order to make them like leave this land. So they were cutting the water wells, uh, they were like preventing access to electricity, demolishing houses, preventing to giving us permission for building homes. And in, in, uh, in under the like they want to drive the people away from their homes and it didn't work all of the all of this pressure the Palestinians doesn't have any other like place to go and they would go to the old caves or invade them set up new tents and stay at their homes until last year last May an Israeli like high court decided to give the green line for the Israeli occupation forces to physically transfer the residents of Masaf Riyadh and destroy their homes to in order to take this land. And the one that wrote this judgment, the political judgment is, a, is a, himself a Zatlar live in the West Bank near, uh, near of Ramallah. Himself is violating the international law by living in, a, in the West Bank, but he's being a judge, a Zatlar judge that wrote the future of 1,300 residents of Masaf Riyata and to give the green light for the Israeli occupation forces to drive these people away and to make them homeless in order to take this land. Since that decision in last May until now, it tells you over than 50 house were whipped out by the Israeli occupation forces, which is very crazy. And last November, I stand and document in a village of Sfai here in Masafriyat an early morning, normal morning, while students were having their class, uh, their lessons in their classrooms. As normally, uh, heavily occupation forces arrived at the school with a bulldozer. The soldiers ran directly to the classrooms, slipped the door, slipped the doors, and started pushing us back as a journalists and parents. And the first moment, one soldier opened uh, the first like stun grenade and threw it at us. When it exploded, the students from the class start to open the windows, crying, taking their books, and running away. From the from the school crying and very tra traumatic like scene I never been in that scene before it was really horrifying and then the soldiers just make like a wall around the, the the school a group of soldiers went inside the school steal the bags of the of the of the kids with the balloons with their chairs with their tables and going out confiscate them and put them in the Israeli military trucks before. Uh, a uh, bulldozer was owned and driven by a sutter who lived in the outpost nearby. In a minute, just bulldozed this school and live away. This these students watched their dream being damaged in front of their eyes. There, there, there was just a school that they can be educated in it. And their parents didn't have that chance to have a school and to be educated, and none of them like educated. And they had this chance for a while to be educated in this school, and they were planning to improve it and to have more class classrooms because it was for a primary uh, primary school and they wanted to improve it but the israeli occupation forces arrived and whipped it out 
the students with the parents built another tent and the army arrived and took it and confiscated another tent and it was also confiscated by the Israeli occupation forces. So now they continue the year in a room by by one of the villagers that donated to, 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 to the teacher and an old caravan that the water link in, in the winter and the sun heat it up in the in the in the summer. So they they uh, since uh, May uh, until Basel, now. Uh, Basel, I want I just wanted to bring in Nora Erakat because we only have a, a, a little bit of time left. Nora, I wanted to ask you the role of the Palestinian Authority uh, while all of this is going on uh, on the West Bank, uh, when these uh, with so many more uh, Palestinians are being displaced and their uh, homes demolished. What has been the role of the Palestinian Authority? Well, unfortunately, Basil can, can, I'm sure, discuss this as well, their, ab their complete absence in Masafar Yatta to prevent or to protect Palestinians to the extent that they've been armed. They use those arms in order to protect the illegal Israeli settlers, in order to demonstrate that they are the good natives that the U.S. and Israel can trust. Since the establishment of the Oslo Peace Agreement, which is an autonomy arrangement of perpetual subjugation, the Palestinian Authority has become an arm and an extension of the occupation in its policing and its suppression of, of freedom of speech um, in actually tearing apart the fabric of Palestinian social, national, um, political life in order to do what most people in power do, which is to preserve that power. They've not even endorsed BDS. Um, as articulated by the 2005 BDS fall, because to them that would undermine their authority to lead their own state. To the extent that they have uh, been, you know, uh, where are they in the discussion about insisting that Israel is an apartheid state? They also have been falling uh, behind and using it um, very um, in, in self-interested ways in order to advance themselves um, and their irrelevance, and yet they are not relevant. To the extent that we've seen them, we've seen them actually um, uh, extrajudicially um, assassinate a Palestinian journalist, Nizar Banat, and then come down hard on the Palestinian people who protested that assassination at the height, at the height of Palestinian grassroots and social power internationally in May 2021 um, during the protest against um, the 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 in, uh, impending takeover of Sheikh Jarrah, and so the Palestinian Authority is part of the problem, and it makes the Palestinian condition even more hard, but even more spectacular. That despite all of these obstacles, Palestinians are able, through their grassroots initiatives, through popular media, through film, through art, through organizing um, across the globe, to be able to continue to get this 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 story out to be able to continue to articulate a unified vision for the future, a decolonial future, one based on the freedom, dignity, um, and justice for all people, and Nora not just Erica, for a few. I want to thank you so much for being with us, Palestinian human rights attorney, associate professor at Rutgers University, author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, speaking to us from Portugal, and Basil Adra, reporter from Masafa Yata uh, for Local Call and 972 magazine, will link to your new pieces, I Was Handcuffed and Blindfolded for Reporting on Settler Violence, and your new piece for The Nation magazine, The Destruction of This Palestinian Community Was Greenlighted by Israel. Supreme Court.